So today I am going to be talking about SARS-CoV-2, and in particular, my talk is titled TANS Travel and Transmission, and I'll be focusing on a variant of SARS-CoV-2 that spread across Europe in the summer of 2020. But before I get into that, I just wanted to make sure that we're all kind of on the same page for the kind of background of the work that I do, which is called molecular epidemiology. And that means using the genetic sequences of the virus. And I wanted to just give a brief introduction to how we actually do that. So if we imagine a pathogen moving through a population, here you can imagine it's transmitting from person to person as the red circles along these black lines. And as you'll have heard many times by now, as that virus moves through the population, it will acquire mutations, here shown as these colored diamonds. But most of these mutations don't change how the virus works. But they're really critical for the work that I do because they're kind of the breadcrumbs that we use to follow and see how the virus changes as it moves around the world. Now, as this virus moves through the population, some people will be sampled as shown in these blue circles. And it's from these samples that we can then extract the genetic material of the virus. So when we do that, we get these genomes, which here I'm just showing as a simple black line. But you can see in these genomes, we can see those mutations that accumulated as the virus started transmitting, um, as the virus was transmitting through the population. And you can start to see even now why these mutations are so important. We can use them to group these sequences. Sequences that share more of the same mutations are more similar. They're more closely related in the transmission chain. You can see that that's true for A and B here. And viruses that have fewer of the same mutations are going to be further apart in their relationship and further apart on the transmission chain. And we can find a way to actually um, make a diagram that relates these different relationships. And this is what we call a phylogenetic tree or a phylogeny. And you can see that this captures that some sequences are more similar, so those sit closer together, and some sequences are less similar and those sit further apart. And we can use the mutations to actually kind of quantify how similar or dissimilar sequences are by showing, you know, whether there's one mutation or two mutations, or if you trace between two sequences, you'll find the total number of mutations that differ between those two sequences. And this is basically kind of the underlying idea of what we do with these virus sequences. But if this is kind of the starting point, and we can actually do even more complicated things. So for example, because we know when the samples were taken, we can do what we call making a time resolve tree. So we can put the samples on the date when they were collected and we can kind of stretch and shrink those branches to reflect when in time the, we last think that, for example, two sequences were related. And we can then take this back and, for example, make some estimates about when a hypothetical ancestor might have existed. And um, that can inform us about kind of how things might have changed through time, even if we don't necessarily have a sample from exactly that time point. Similarly, because we know where samples were taken, we can also try and infer where the virus might have been in the past. So if we know that a lot of samples came from one country, we might infer that the ancestor for these sequences was in that red country, and then one sample or, or one transmission happened that took it to the green country. But when we get into these types of analyses, of course, we always have to be mindful of the biases in our data. We can only infer things that we have some information about. So for example, we would never infer from these samples that the virus started in yellow country because we have no samples from yellow country. And similarly, if we have many more samples from one country than another, that can skew our idea of how things might have happened. So we have to keep in mind um, you know, what data we have and how that might be influencing the computational analysis we do, and then of course, how we end up interpreting that. But all of this of course is, um, is still a great uh, kind of background for what we do at NextStrain, which has already been beautifully introduced. And I would certainly second that if you haven't seen NextStrain, you can check it out at nextstrain.org. It's both the really cool website you'll see when you go there, and it's also the analysis software that actually makes those phylogenetic trees, makes those additional analyses, and combines that with the additional metadata that then ends up being surfaced on those websites. And the whole purpose of NextStrain was, of course, to track epidemics and pandemics in real time. We've been doing that for a while, since about 2015, and we've done this with a number of different pathogens. I'm showing just a few here, though most, mostly we're kind of known for before the pandemic for our work on influenza, and of course, more recently on our work on SARS-CoV-2. And in particular, I think what people know us for in general 
um, is our kind of innovative and intuitive and interactive interface. So the website is really exploratory. You can change a bunch of things, zoom in, look at different attributes, and that makes the data um, accessible in a way that phylogenetic trees aren't always. And as was already said, all of our code is open source. Um, so it's very, we try and keep it very transparent um, and try and keep in touch with what is useful for people that are using our website and our software. And I just wanna give a quick shout out for the Next Strain team because it's certainly a team effort. Most of the team is um, based in the US with Trevor Bedford, one of the co-founders. Some of us are here in Switzerland with the other co-founder, Richard Nair, and James Hadfield is in New Zealand. So we're in a strange position where we, we can literally work on Next Strain 24 hours a day because of our beautiful time zone distribution. Um, but through Next Strain, of course, we've had a lot of focus on SARS-CoV-2 almost exclusively this year. And you'll see if you go to nextstrain.org, something like this. So this is our default SARS-CoV-2 view. And you can see it's much more complicated than the toy examples that I showed at the beginning of the talk, but the underlying ideas are still the same. When viruses are closer together on the tree, they're more closely related than viruses that are separated and further apart. And you can see we have an amazing representation of countries here. I think we have um, over about half the countries in the world. But of course, as I mentioned, that means we don't have every country and we don't always have representative sampling or even recent samples from a country. So we have to be always really cautious about sample bias as far as where we have data from and how much. And we're incredibly blessed in this regard because we now have over a million sequences on a database called uh, GISAID, which is where we get our sequences from, which is unprecedented. We've never had this many sequences for a pathogen, let alone one that you know, we didn't even know existed um, a little bit more than a year ago. So it is a, an amazing example of what we're able to accomplish with, with the sequencing technology of today and open data sharing. Just to be very clear though, what, what we have on NextRain is not a million sequences. Um, we run these every weekday, so we do need them to finish the builds within 24 hours. And this is all rendered in the browser and rendering a million sequences in your browser would be probably crash your whole browser. So we, we trim these down to about 4,000 representative sequences for our global build. And then we also maintain builds for six different regions of the world. And then finally, people both within NextRain and many groups outside of NextRain also maintain um, builds within NextRain software, but focused on their, their country, maybe their state, their canton, their region, their town, which are really useful for seeing that more fine grained um, attributes of the pandemic, which in many cases are important right now for kind of outbreak response, and especially since global travel is certainly not happening at the, at the usual scale. But when we have all these sequences, we have this fancy software, what can we actually do with it? And one thing I wanted to cover, uh, there's obviously many things we can do with these, this information. I don't have time to go through with it today, but I wanted to highlight how we can tell, for example, the difference between sequence or case importation versus local transmission. So we're gonna take a quick kind of rewind in time to more than a year ago. So to the end of February, 2020, this was the next strain tree at the time. And this is actually all of the sequences we had. We just didn't have that many comparatively. I've minimized some of these. These are these skinny lines. And I'm focusing just on samples from the USA at the end of February, 2020. And when we look at this tree, you can see the samples are really scattered through the tree. They're kind of randomly plopped down all over the place. And very few of them are actually closely linked together. And this is a kind of classic example of imported cases. So we have a, a diversity within SARS-CoV-2 and we're essentially kind of picking random bits of that diversity to, to have in the USA, which kind of represents people bringing cases back, for example, from Asia. They're kind of a random sample of what's circulating there. But if we fast forward just a week, you can see that something has changed in the tree. In particular, we can see this large cluster of sequences right here, and these sit incredibly closely together. And this is a, a sign of, sorry, a sign of a change to local transmission. What actually happened here a little bit um, famously is the Seattle flu study, who was gathering information about flu transmission in Seattle, started testing their samples for SARS-CoV-2 as well, which was against CDC guidelines at the time. But not only did they find that some of these people did have SARS-CoV-2, but those samples didn't scatter across the tree. These weren't people who had lied about their travel history or had a connection to someone who'd randomly been to, to Asia. 
These were people that whose sequences were identical or nearly identical, which shows that they were very closely related in that transmission chain, a really strong indication of ongoing local transmission. And you can imagine how telling these two things apart can be important for your public health interventions. So what you might do if most of your cases are being imported might change if you realize that essentially the virus is now here and spreading locally. Unfortunately, there, this didn't uh, account to much kind of public health change in the US at the time, but at least in theory, this can be a really important indication about what might be these most useful interventions, and even if not, how the virus is spreading and where it's starting to spread locally. Now, this is, of course, a year ago and probably, you know, is very interesting, but might not seem so relevant now. But we've actually kind of seen this happen again much more recently if we think about the variants of concern, and in particular, the 501YV1 or the B117 variant, which was first detected in the UK. When this was found, we knew that it was very highly likely that it was going to be picked up in Europe soon, if not already. And if we actually look, so kind of fast forwarding a year, so now February 2021, this is a, these are sequences from the Netherlands, and this is just the part of the tree that's the B117 part of the tree. And you can see that we see the same pattern of kind of randomly scattered samples that indicate probably direct transmission from the UK to the Netherlands. It's this random importation, so people arriving and bringing the virus with them. But we can also start to see some very distinct clusters, one up here and a really big one down here, where the sequences are incredibly closely related. And this really likely um, indicates local ongoing transmission. So this was an indication we were able to see this, you know, kind of across Europe. And it was an indication that um, despite travel bans, you know, B117 was in Europe and that it was probably going to be very hard to get under control because it was already spreading locally. And of course, now we can see that B117 has become by far to dominate across Europe. But I want to step away from the variants of concern. And actually, most of this talk, I want to focus about a different variant that we also saw start to spread and start to dominate in Europe. And this is one that um, you might have heard about from, from my work or in other contexts. This started spreading across Europe in the summer of 2020. So this is called E1. It's a cluster that's defined by a spike mutation at position 222. And it's shown here in orange. This is a, a little GIF that goes from July 2020 through to the end of November 2020. So this is to avoid the beginning edge of the VOCs coming on the scene. And you can see how much of the map starts changing to orange as the GIF plays and as time goes on. And actually, um, E1 made up um, over 40%, uh, I think it was over 40% of the sequences in Europe by the end of November 2020, and in particular in Western Europe, in many countries, it really came to dominate. So um, how did this happen and how can we kind of get a better handle of what happened here? Well, we can actually look back in time and we can ask kind of week on week, what proportion of sequences for countries in Europe fell into EU1. So what proportion of sequences were EU1 over time? And when we do this for a few different countries across Europe, we get a chart like this, where of course the, the y-axis is kind of the proportion of EU1 sequences out of the total sequences. And then this is time running across the x-axis. And of course, the most notable thing to see really is, is that this seems to have started in Spain. So we see EU1 first appearing in Spain, really quickly rising to prominence um, through, through June, getting up to about 50% of sequences and then continuing to increase more slowly until it was by far the most dominant variant circulating in Spain by the end of 2020. Now, the other thing happening last summer, as I'm sure many of you remember, is that we'd just been through you know, a really harsh lockdown. And in the middle of June, the borders, which had been closed pretty much pretty tightly across Europe, started reopening and summer holiday travel started to resume. And we can see that kind of after this point, from July onwards, we start to see EU1 popping up in many other countries around Europe, and again, increasing and starting to spread and then kind of plateauing. Though these dynamics did differ a little bit. So in some countries like Ireland, EU1 came to dominate almost as much as in Spain. In places like France, it didn't seem to get too high. And in some countries like Norway, it seems like they kind of had an outbreak of EU1, got it under control, but uh, it kind of came back again later in the year. So if we want to look a little bit more at kind of how do we think that this, um, this variant might have spread, how did it start? And if it did come from Spain, how did it start moving to other countries? One way we can do this is we can actually look at the genetic sequences to start unpicking how samples from different countries are related. 
So this graph is a little bit complicated, but there's just a couple of important takeaways here. So first of all, this is sequences just through the 30th of September. That's because we're mostly interested here at the beginning of this EU1 expansion. And this uh, phylogeny, essentially, it just gets more and more complicated the more sequences you contain, and it gets really hard to fit onto a PowerPoint slide. So this is OK to have this cutoff because we're really interested in what happened at the beginning. And what we've done here is essentially any time the phylogeny expanded only in one country. So there might have been originally this kind of uh, bright blue, which is Denmark. There might have been a branch coming off here, which is just sequences from Denmark. We've collapsed that down. So we've said that we're not so interested in expansion within a country. But what we want to know is this genome was shared between multiple countries. So from you know, this hypothetical ancestor, this was spreading in Denmark in the UK, in Spain, and in some other countries that have been um, changed to gray. And so this can tell us a little bit about, you know, where are different genotypes of the virus found um, when, you know, kind of in earlier in the history and later in the history of EU1. And the first thing we can notice is, again, Spain is in red, and we can see a lot of Spain uh, scattered through this tree. And in particular, in these early nodes, we see, you know, a lot of Spain early on, which um, supports this hypothesis that this at least really started expanding and spreading to other countries from Spain. We can also see that Spain shares diversity with lots of countries, which again supports the idea that this moved from Spain to other countries, carrying Spanish diversity to other countries in Europe. The other thing we can take note of is the, the number of times we see different colors. So for example, the UK is in this kind of denim blue, Switzerland is in this orange, and we can see quite a lot of those two colors across the tree, which seems, which probably kind of implies that there were multiple introductions. So there was a lot of diversity in Spain, and we see a lot of that diversity being found in the UK and in Switzerland, indicating there were probably multiple times when this was carried, EU1 was carried from Spain to other countries. On the other hand, for countries like Iceland in the royal blue or Norway in this salmon pink, we can actually only find a few of these circles that have those colors. So in Iceland, there's one here, one here, and one here. Um, and really what this tells us is there were, there were very fewer number of introductions to Iceland. And actually the majority of Iceland's EU1 outbreak seems to have stemmed from one particular introduction that then really took off, shown by such a big circle here. And Norway is very similar. We actually have two slices, two pies or two circles that have this pink color indicating there was just a couple of introductions to Norway. So there's variation in how often EU1 might have been carried between Spain and other countries. Now, of course, when we saw this expansion, um, particularly we were looking at this kind of mid-September, what occurred to us at first was, you know, oh my gosh, it has a spike mutation. Is this a variant that's more transmissible? And, and there was certainly a few weeks of worry there while we, we started investigating this and kind of gave a heads up to the ECDC and the, the Swiss authorities. But as we looked into this more and more, we actually came to believe that that may not necessarily be how EU1 spread across Europe. We have also now done some pseudotype lentivirus lab work where we put this mutation into viruses in the lab and we, we failed to find any significant difference in anything that we measured by this mutation, which supports that it doesn't seem like there's a real difference that's caused by this 2D2 mutation. Certainly nothing like the other mutations we see in variants of concern now, which often cause very distinct changes in the virus. And really, the more we looked, we started to believe that travel is really the main uh, mechanism by which EU1 spread across Europe. And we can look at this a couple of ways. So first of all, we actually can look at the incidence of SARS-CoV-2 um, from spring to kind of autumn across different countries in Europe. And we can see that, you know, thanks to the lockdown, thanks to the the great efforts of many countries, the cases were coming down really nicely through the spring and to the early summer, we were seeing really, really wonderful kind of low numbers of cases. Unfortunately, what we can also see is that in Spain, there started to be an increase in the number of cases and to some extent in Belgium as well, which is this light orange, much earlier than in other countries in Europe. So if you can kind of compare this red line to the majority of the other lines here, case numbers in Spain were increasing earlier and were higher than in mo most other countries in Europe at the time. And of course, you can see that this was happening at about the same time that the borders were reopening and summer travel was resuming. And we can, we can look at that as well by looking at, um, this is actually the departures from Spain normalized to the size of the country, the, the number of residents in the country over time. And here you can see 
very clearly when borders reopened and people started very excitingly you know, going on the holidays, make up for this, this terrible lockdown. And of course, Spain is a beautiful country with wonderful weather and amazing, amazing beaches and, 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 and the wilderness. Many people chose to go to Spain. And so we can see those numbers really shoot up through the peak of summer, they started to come down. Some countries did start imposing um, travel restrictions on Spain as the case numbers increased. Others did that later. But in general, we really start to see a real dip in the numbers kind of at a more natural um, September, October time when summer holidays are kind of traditionally coming to an end. Now, one thing I just want to point out quickly here is that we have a big diversity here in what restrictions were for these countries as far as traveling to Spain. And for example, Ireland never actually had quarantine free travel to Spain. You had to quarantine if you went to Spain and returned to Ireland um, through the whole of the summer period. But you wouldn't necessarily guess that if, from just looking at this graph. Certainly, when I started working on this naively, I kind of believed that if you had very strict quarantine requirements, it would probably deter travel, certainly to me. It, felt like that's the choice that I would make. If I had to quarantine, I'd, I'd go somewhere else. But it's a good reminder to me that we really have to think carefully about the things that we may assume naively might come from things like travel restrictions may or may not play out how we imagine them. And it's really important that we always keep um, in mind kind of the difference between the reality and what we might expect naively from perhaps our own personal experience, which you know, may not extend to everyone else, of course. Everyone you know, has their own decisions and, and priorities. But we can, we can take these two things, the incidence, the, the levels of SARS-CoV-2 in different countries, and the travel patterns from people going to and from Spain over the summer. And we were actually able to look at these in even more details. We were able to get the incidence actually at a lower level than just countries. So per Spanish province over time. And then we were actually able to work with a company, we were able to get anonymized mobile phone roaming data. So we knew who from which country in Europe went to Spain and how long they stayed and when in the summer that was and which Spanish province they went to. So we had really detailed information of where people were going and when, what the situation was like when they were there. And then of course, we were also able to combine that with information about what was going on with the SARS-CoV-2 epidemic when they got home. So how was that expanding? How was that changing? And essentially we were able to pull all of these things together and to make a simple model that tried to estimate, kind of approximate what proportion of cases were EU1 in different countries across Europe taking these things into account. And you can see that we create, we kind of recreate the dynamics pretty well here with an increase starting in June, really taking off in July growing and then kind of plateauing um, over the, the end of summer and the beginning of August. And it, this, this kind of, um, the, the, the overall dynamics is not bad compared to what we see in the real data. But if you look closely, you might notice where the problem is. On the real data here with the dots, the y-axis goes from zero to 100%. In the model data, the simple model data, it goes from zero to 12%. So while the dynamics aren't bad, the scale is very off. Now it does vary how much we're off though. So for example, we estimate about 12% in our simple model for France. And actually that's pretty consistent with what we see in the real data, but that's, that's about the only one that we get spot on. For most other countries, we've got a pretty serious underestimate of the proportion of their cases that are EU1 over time. And we can look at this more um, in more detail by looking at, so the real data again is in the dots. This model data is the smooth line, but here we've multiplied our simulated data to try and make it match the real data. And then you can see the multiplier here. So again, for France, we've actually got this pretty good. We're, we're hitting our, our simulated model is hitting our observed data very well. For other countries, we're doing kind of okay. We're having to multiply for, for Switzerland, Germany, Belgium, and the Netherlands, somewhere about you know, between two to, two to four times to, to make the, the model data match the real data. For other countries, we're, we're way off. We're having to multiply somewhere between seven and 11 times to match the model to the real data for other countries in Europe. So why do we have this discrepancy? And why is it so different for different countries? Because it's not like we've got one thing that's off you know, equally for all countries. So we started to look into kind of some differences here. And I, and I think we can find some really interesting things. So for example, not every country goes to the same place when they go on holiday. And that's true even if they're all going to Spain. 
So for example, people who come from France to go to Spain have the luxury that for many, it's within driving distance. So many people from France, they essentially kind of stick close to the north of the country, uh, perhaps the, the less famous areas, the areas that are probably or may attract fewer tourists from other places and um, tend to kind of disperse across the northern regions of, of Spain. In contrast, visitors from the UK head to the south of Spain and to many of the islands, and they frequent areas that I think many of us might recognize. So places like Ibiza, Benidorm, Mallorca, Malaga, Tenerife, places that are really known as um, tourist destinations and kind of resort hotspots. And we can actually see that there are correlations like this across countries in Europe. So for example, people from Switzerland and France visit kind of the same areas in Spain in many cases, people from <clears throat> excuse me, from Denmark and the UK also have similarities in where they visit, but don't really overlap with where visitors from Switzerland and France might go. <clears throat> excuse me. And of course, where you go and why you're choosing these destinations can make a difference. And it also captures that in many of these cases, particularly <clears throat> many of, <clears throat> excuse me, particularly many of the resorts in the south of Spain, that the, the incidence at the province level may not be really capturing the actual inference differences where people are going. So for example, many of the people that go to resorts, they aren't visiting the province, they're visiting one city or even you know, possibly one area of one city. And the incidence there might be much higher than the province average in general. And of course, what activities you're undertaking if you go to a mountainous area versus going to a beach resort are also probably quite different. And even if your activities are the same, say visiting a restaurant, the chance of your getting SARS-CoV-2 is gonna be really different compared to if that restaurant is really busy or whether it, you know, there's much fewer people there because you're in a less crowded space. So there probably isn't necessarily equal chances of getting SARS-CoV-2, you know, um, depending on how people are dispersing themselves, why they're going there and what the situation is when they get there. So, we were curious, is our model, model accurately predicting the incidence of travelers? Are we actually accurately predicting your chance of coming back with SARS-CoV-2, which essentially would be the EU1 variant because that was what was most prevalent for most of the summer in Spain. Are we accurately predicting that chance um, compared to what we can see in real data? And we're actually able to look into this um, through data from Germany. The German government actually records information on which cases seem to be associated with travel to Spain. So we can look at how well our model is doing. Here is the number of cases that were reported by the government in orange as being associated with travel to Spain. And here is our model in blue. And you can see that, yes, we are really underestimating the chance that someone comes back from Spain with SARS-CoV-2. It seems like in real life, people had a much higher chance of actually bringing back SARS-CoV-2 after a visit from Spain in the summer. Similarly, we can use this kind of same travel information to look for differences, for example, perhaps in uh, the type of people or the ages of people that went on holiday in Spain and came back with SARS-CoV-2 compared to those who acquired it at home. So from Switzerland, we were able to look into this. So these are cases from people in Switzerland, either acquired in Spain or acquired in Switzerland over the summer of 2020. We can see that the age of people who, who had a, a acquired SARS-CoV-2 in Spain is a bit younger than those who, who acquired it in Switzerland over the same time period. Now we know from other epidemiological studies that young people, for example, have more contacts. And so it might be that your chance of um, getting SARS-CoV-2 or in particular passing it on when you got home is not necessarily the same just given the people who are more likely um, to bring back SARS-CoV-2 from Spain versus to get it in Switzerland. And of course, there's then even more complex behaviors on top of these things that are just almost impossible to measure, like you know, the risk of just traveling, sitting on a plane, a bus, a train, you know, being in a resort, maybe sharing hotel rooms with friends. Those are not the same behaviors as if you decide not to travel that summer, but this is really hard to get data on or to try and incorporate into a model, but almost surely is playing an effect here. Now, one last thing that you might have noticed from the graph I showed earlier, which again, the real data is with the dots, the model is in the solid line, but multiplied, is that for some countries, we actually see in the real data, a, a kind of a second rise in cases. But in the autumn, after the peak summer holiday travel period, we see this rise in EU1 cases. And one thing that our model is not really taking into consideration as well is what's going on 
um, after introductions might have been initially mostly spreading from Spain. So in this graph, we can see EU1 is the solid line. And if it's in, and, and then all SARS-CoV-2 is the dotted line. If it's in Spain, it's red, outside of Spain is black. And really the most important thing to see here is that here um, through September, there's more EU1 cases in Spain than outside of Spain, but this switches in about the middle of September. Now there's more EU1 outside of Spain than there is inside of Spain. And at the same time, of course, we know that travel guidelines were starting to really change at the end of summer, beginning of August. Many countries did impose travel restrictions to Spain at this point. And we actually think that a lot of EU1 introductions um, in the later part of, or in, in autumn time, were coming from e other EU countries or other European countries to each other. So other countries now had a significant proportion of EU1 cases, travel restrictions between those countries were often a lot less. And so essentially all of Europe was now swapping EU1. Um, and we can actually see when we look at the phylogeny for some, some of these later um, introductions that these are, do not tie back into Spanish diversity, but instead are often connected to other countries in Europe. And our model doesn't include this at all. We focus only on exports from Spain, which might be, which almost certainly explains why our model isn't then capturing these, these second rises that we see in some countries. So just to summarize, um, first of all, you know, we, we looked at the lab-based data and we don't see any clear evidence of a significant difference in, in antibody binding or transmission um, for this 222 mutation that defines EU1. We think that this spread initially from Spain and then, as I just told you, between other countries in Europe, uh, kind of at the end of summer and beginning of August, and really came to dominate Europe um, uh, by the end of 2020 before the variants of concern came to rise. Now, our simple model, as I showed you, it's far from perfect, but it does approximate that kind of rise timing and the, then the plateau pretty well. But what we aren't capturing, for example, is that we really underestimate your risk of bringing back SARS-CoV-2 from being in Spain, probably because we aren't able to control for a lot of behavioral differences, perhaps regional differences and differences in incidence in different areas below that province level. We also aren't capturing introductions from Spanish countries, as I said, that later exchange of EU1 between non-Spanish countries in Europe. And we aren't capturing different differences in behavior or age differences, even down to things like, you know, who decided to travel last summer versus who didn't might make a big difference in your actual uh, chances of getting SARS-CoV-2, no matter what you do. But it's really hard to include these in models. And essentially what we think is that EU1 really came to dominate primarily through travel and, and associated travel factors, not through any significant transmission difference. Now, I think at this point, it's, it's, it's fair to ask. I mean, that, that's super interesting. Sounds great. But we're talking about summer of 2020. Why do we care about this now? What impact does this have? You know, I don't know if you've noticed, Emma, but we've got variants of concern on the doorstep. Why do we care so much about this EU1 that's not even more transmissible? But I think that there's actually some really important lessons for us to learn here. So for one thing, it really highlights the failures in our travel system across Europe last summer. So even though we could see, for example, that cases were rising in Spain much faster than other countries, there was a lot of pressure on governments to allow borders to open and to resume summer travel regardless. And this, we probably paid a bit of a price for this. There was also really a lack of screening as people were coming back from their holidays. Most countries operated an honor system quarantine. You know, you just had to promise you stayed at home. There was essentially, I think only Germany was offering voluntary testing if you, when you returned. For most countries, testing was not available unless you paid for it. And then finally, what one would hope is that even if you came back from your holiday with SARS-CoV-2, it wouldn't be able to spread very well because the track and trace or the test and trace system in your country would stop that transmission chain early enough. But instead we see that these viruses, uh, this EU1, when it did get imported to countries, it was able to get a really good foothold and it was able to spread in many countries to become the dominant variant, particularly in Western Europe. So the track and trace or the test and trace systems were not able to contain this spread when it was being imported. And this is all, of course, to kind of break down that travel imports are important. They can impact epidemics and those epidemic dynamics. Of course, that will depend on what the situation is in your particular country. If you have a raging epidemic going on already, then travel you know, may not be your biggest concern. But particularly when countries have fought so hard to get cases down, what you're importing and how you're preventing that or how you're handling that could have a big impact as to 
um, how cases then kind of roll over the next few months and what your epidemic, what shape your epidemic dynamics take. And I think that all of this work also highlights that tracking variants is important. Even before the variants of concern, we wouldn't have been able to put this together and see the impact of our travel policies last summer that this caused with this E1 variant if we didn't have all of these samples, if we weren't able to track these and we, you know, connect these across Europe. I mean, there's no way you would be able to pull together, you know, all of the travel data just from, you know, government records and trying to follow people up for all of Europe. But with genetics, we can do this. But the last point that I think is really one of the most important right now in the face of variants of concern is to just highlight that, you know, E1 became the dominant variant in Western Europe without being more transmissible. So when we see a rise in the frequency of a particular variant or a particular cluster of SARS-CoV-2 sequences, we need to keep in mind that this is not necessarily always due to viral changes. We do see clear examples now, E117 being the shining star, that we do have variants that have increased transmission. For other variants, it's almost certainly at least partially increased transmission. But I think it's a really important reminder of just how powerful human behavior can be and that we can't underestimate that and how difficult it can be to separate out what is real viral increase in transmission and what is human behavior or changes in restrictions or something else that's not necessarily virally caused. And how can we make sure that we're divvying that up kind of fairly and taking account both of what we can do through our behaviors that makes change and what the virus is doing through the changes that it has. And with that, I just wanna show a quick slide for everyone that was involved in this work. They were amazing to work with. It was a super pleasurable experience and it couldn't have been done without all of the different talents. And for more information, I'd encourage you to check out, we have a preprint online. I've put a little tiny URL to make it easier to get to. Um, we're hoping this will be published soon. You can also check out covariants.org for an overview of all the variants I'm tracking at the moment. And of course, you can go to Next Strain. If you go to this particular URL, you can find a map if you scroll down that shows all of the Next Strain bills that are being maintained by many, many people around the globe and find the ones that perhaps interest your area. And with that, I'd like to thank you all for listening. And I'm, I'm hoping that we can have some few minutes for some interesting discussions.